Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and I'm here today with Bill Woodich, uh, a Steelers fan. I know we already clashed about this. Immediately he saw my Chiefs and he's a Steelers fan, but at least we're not Patriots fans. We agreed upon that. So that was one thing that we have. But welcome, Bill, to the show. Let me tell you a little bit about what I know about Bill. Number one, he is an expert at talking about mindset, changing your mindset, He's got two best-selling books, Always Forward and Fail More, and we are going to dig in today to talking about failing more. Failing is the key to success. You guys know how I feel about fear. You know how I feel about failure. You know about all this, but we want to hear from experts. I'm just Kristen, and we want to hear from Bill because he is more the mindset expert when he talks about failure and fear. So Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kristen. I just want to keep listening to you. You're on fire. Just, just keep rolling with that stuff. You know what? We already got, we already have the bonds of commonality because we, we detest, abhor, and otherwise hate the Patriots. So we're in good shape there. We are fans of the sport, but we just have to cut them out of the sport, right? Yeah, we got to put things first. First things first. It's okay if you're a Steelers fan. <laughs> I'm okay if the Chiefs fan. As long as we're not fans of Tom Brady, we're okay. <laughs> uh, I'm with you 100%. Okay, so tell us a little bit about you. I know you come, um, you, you said you had a dead-end job that you absolutely hated and you moved yourself away from that. Start there and let's talk about that and what moved you in towards the mindset space. I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, hence the blood right, the Pittsburgh Steelers. A very small town, about 3,800 people. It was in the middle of the woods. It was called the Allegheny National Forest and a small town, 3,800 people called Kane, known for being the iceberg, the coldest place, the refrigerator of the United States. It, it is that cold. And the rite of passage is one of two ways. You either stay in the town and go to work in one of the factories or or if you're a good student and you have a forward thinking process that you can play life forward and think my way out has to be to be able to go to school, you study real hard, take home books and do all the things I didn't do. <laughs> so I was a terrible student. You know, I was a terrible student. I was, I, I, people said I had this potential and I, I didn't know what that word meant. I didn't bring home any books and I ended up in a factory. So I think this is very important with fear. I think we have to be in touch with what our dominant fear is. And boy, did that fear surface in that factory because I was consigned to do the same thing every day from 8.30 to 5, punch three, hole, three holes in a piece of wood for eight hours. You know, they told you when you can have lunch. They told you when you have to come in. If you didn't, they docked you that $3.25 an hour. Sounded you know, a lot so, like prison. <laughs> of my own making. Yeah. And I think that's important for your, for your listener, for your viewer. You can make that prison. You can make it by choices. And you have the key to unlock those invisible walls if you choose to do those things that move through fear. So, Kristen, my biggest fear was staying there and never being able to get out. I got a lucky break. And that break was an opportunity to go to school. And when I took that break, I made the best of it. And I kept going from those woods in that foreclosed future in a factory all the way to the beaches of Southern California. And a lot of it moved through fear. I got a question about that because you, you had just talked about being a terrible student and how you weren't a good student. Horrible. So how did you move from going to that factory, getting an opportunity to go to school? Wasn't there fear surrounding school and thinking, I'm a terrible student. How am I going to make it through school? You hit it right there on the, uh, you, you hit the nail right on the head. And I'll face my biggest fear with that. I didn't want to ever put myself out and get to a point where I failed because I would come up short in my own eyes because my, my version of success was always to be the best version of my own expectations. You know, success to me was living on my expectations. Here I was falling short before I even started. So my biggest fear, you're right. And when I got there, I thought I have one of two ways. I can go back on my shield, or I can really apply myself and see if I can do this because either I can or I can't, but I don't want regret. And so I, uh, for the first time in my life, Kristen, I faced fear, the fear of coming up short, and I actually applied myself. Did That's pretty well amazing. With it, by the way. Because, and I think a lot of people miss that because I think yeah. li living with regret to me is worse than trying and failing over and over again. I don't want to get to the end of this year, this month or my life and say, gosh, I wish I had blah, blah, blah. And I think people mistake 
failure and, and moving on to something different as opposed to um, a change, a pivot. So you did not fail at your factory job. You just chose, you just decided that that wasn't for you anymore and you wanted to move on to something else, something bitter, bigger, something better. What you just said is huge for people to keep in mind at all times and that's regret. You need to play it forward and think, what is it that I can do right now? Because I had the physical, physical wherewithal, the intellect, the, the ability to do these things with a vibrancy and a vitality. What can I do right now that I might not be able to do at 90 years old or 85 and look back and go, oh, wow, I wish I would have done that. That is the ultimate to me failure is not getting in play and trying it. You know, regret is something that, that I absolutely detest. I detest regret. I don't want to live with regret. I make decisions to pass or fail. Someone asked me, speaking of, you know, football, going back to that for a second, I had an opportunity to go to the Super Bowl this year to watch the Chiefs win, but actually chose not to. I, I, was, I actually put it on Facebook. I was like, hey, should I go to the Super Bowl? Should I not? Like, I literally could have gone. Um, there was a lot of factors playing into it. We were just coming back from a huge Puerto Rican vacation, and I literally would have had to hop a plane, go to Miami, do the thing, come back and then I would just I thought and thought about this and I thought am I gonna have regret yes or no that decision was based on regret it had nothing to do with finances had nothing to do with time and travel I could have worked all that out the idea for me was am I gonna have regret about this decision and regret is something that is really close to me because my dad passed away a few years ago um, to cancer. And one of the things that he said before he passed away was that he used to, I, growing up, he was always pretty tight with his money. Don't waste money. Don't spend stuff on frivolous stuff. Don't buy the boat. The boat's just a hole you put your hole in the water you put your money in. That's what he used to say, right? But when he was passing away, he said, you know what? I lived my whole life waiting and waiting and waiting to do things when I retired and I'm never going to get that opportunity. And he said to me, buy the boat, take the vacation, do the things while you're young and while you're healthy, because you might not get another shot. And that was just like my lifelong permission to never have regrets. So I, I absolutely love that. And again, I didn't go to the Super Bowl because I knew I wasn't going to have regrets. I decided I wanted to celebrate that win because I knew they were going to win. Wait, did um, they win? Because I, yes. I didn't know. Yes, okay, you good. Did. You, you told me four it. times. Don't they lie. Won. I got it. Okay. So, one. But seriously, no, everyone, someone asked me even recently, did you regret sure. not going? What if they never go back? Well, and I said, no, because I got to celebrate that win with my favorite people at my house, celebrating people all together. Uh, it was amazing. So I have no regrets, but will I go eventually if they go back? Probably. No, they're not, go they're not going back, uh, but you can always, you know, sign up to my bandwagon and, and get on the black and gold because one day, <laughs> one day, Sunday. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, uh, I remember when I was at Penn state getting my master's, because I, I loved, then I eventually loved to learn, made Dean's List and did all that great stuff that, that came with learning and, and actually applying myself. But I, I learned by working in a bar called the Rathskeller that uh, free beer tomorrow was a sign above the door. And you know what? There was never free beer because think about it. Free beer tomorrow. It's always free beer tomorrow. There's two points I want to jump back on. I was, the write downs as you were speaking, I, I wrote them down. And I think it's very important for people to ask that question about regret. Ask the question before you go into an endeavor. If you have fear, you have uncertainty. Of course you do. Well, ask the question, will I regret if I don't take an action? What actions do I take? Before I go there, will I have regret if I don't do these things? That's number one. And, and number two, I, we, the Greeks will tell us we have a right to search for happiness. You know, our, our founding fathers would tell us it's one of our inalienable rights, you know, the pursuit of happiness. But people become unhappy when they do the if and when. I'll be happy if I get the car, if I get the boat, if I get the promotion, I'll be happy when I arrive here. And they forget the entire thing about the joy of the process. And when they get to that destination, 99% of the time, they ain't happy. They ain't. Okay, this is where you picked me up from that segue because what you said was beautiful. You know, that's the, the thing about the thing about that journey is that you're learning throughout the entire process. And we, we've learned how we've had plenty of advice about like how to bounce back from failure, how how to do, um, you know, OK, we all fail. Right. We all know that we've all have a long list of failures. Like name one name one of yours. What's one of the things that you literally miserably failed at that then gave you fear to continue? Prior preparation prevents, you know, P poor planning, right? You can take the three letters that P stands for in that one, or actually four, I think it is. But I would have never got on the show with a Kansas City Chiefs fan. That's number one. Uh, number two, I, <laughs> now actually my biggest failure that I really have a, a regret for, but I couldn't have seen at the time or could have seen if I had done more diligence is a seven figure mistake I made where it cost us seven figures to do an acquisition that in no way fit 
the culture of the company, but the numbers made so much sense to me. I thought we're going to make it fit. We're going to shoehorn this thing until it fits. But when the, the culture didn't fit, the values didn't fit. And when they are antithetical to yours, you're going to fail no matter how much money is involved. That was my biggest failure, monetarily anyway. Honestly, guys, listen up here. Seven figure failure. Like yeah. some of us will never even reach a seven figure business to begin with. But you could you imagine a seven figure failure yet? He continues Ouch. on. He continues Ouch. on. Some of you guys are worried about a seven dollar failure, but think about in the long run, what does that do? What does that do for you? You you have to nail in the fact that failure is a bruise. It's temporary. It fades. It hurts. It might hurt your bank account. Definitely your pride. Probably your process. But the reality is, it fades, and then you face the then what? You can either sit there and continue to poke the bruise and poke the hurt and remind yourself that that hurt, or you can decide that it's faded it's gone. I'm going to move forward. And you can either have regret or you can have another failure to learn from. So how can you, how do you can intentionally bounce back from failure? We all have these failures. What did you do about this seven figure failure? Cause that literally makes me want to choke. I'm like, ah, well, you know? it, 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 it hurt and, and it hurt a lot. And it was uh, not only a bruise, but it was a pretty deep cut. And the thing that I found that really is a salve for a bruise or a, um, maybe it's a suture for a cut is action. So immediately I understood it for what it was. I didn't sugarcoat it. I looked in the mirror. I owned it. I owned it. I hurt for a few days and I acted immediately. I started changing the dynamics of what happened there, making sure that it would never happen in this footprint, change some of the economic variables in the acquisition so I could still make some money that in three years might offset some of that loss. And then I did the thing that I wrote about. I move forward because life is always forward. You can't stay here medically sealed in this vacuum, hoping and thinking you're going to grow just by doing nothing. It won't work. It's not physics. It doesn't support. So I learned from that mistake. It became a huge teacher of mine. I, I learned that money it has a, you know, when you just chase the money and you don't go with that gut instinct, you're going to lose most of the time, if not all of the time. And uh, it changed the nature of how we did business. So uh, that's what I learned from that. And that's how I got through it is by taking action, not lamenting and wallowing, not forgetting, but applying for effect. And I have to say something about the lamenting and the, and the gr grieving process of failure, because we all have that. When we get this hurt, that bruise or a deep cut, if you will, whatever that is, we have to allow ourselves a period of time to feel that. And I call it camping, right? Camping is temporary. You go, you set up your camp, you have your pity party over some roasted marshmallows and a fire, and then you take your camp down and you move on. You have to move on. You don't stay camping forever. It's a temporary thing. So camping on that fear and that the lamenting and the grieving, okay, have your pity party, but you know, no one's going to show up to your pity party, just you. And then you've got to move on and take that action. I'm an advocate for small steps. So, so talk to our listeners about, they, they have this big fear, the fear of failure, because they just had this fear, this failure that they had, like you had the seven figure fear. So what do you do then? You take action. Action is the antidote to fear, right? Doing something and moving forward. So when I advocate for small steps, what is the first small step that you took to get away from that significant deep cut um, into something better? It's called the Ethiopian proverb to how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. First thing I would like for your listeners to do is to go back to their successes. Think about how that felt. So it's a feeling first before it's a cognitive thought. Think about the feeling of success and what they did and how the hard work. So for me, it was coming out of that factory, learning how to learn, being shamed in front of people because I couldn't really spell or couldn't really speak or couldn't really write. But then spending that time till four in the morning, doing the work. You're never going to evade the work if you want to succeed. There is no four hour anything. You're not going Amen to, to that. The work. Roll <laughs> your sleeves up, do the work, baby. It's, success is about really how much you're willing to endure because you're going to hit, get hit, you're going to get stung, but you gotta prepare to win, position yourself to win. So the small steps for me, go back and think about those small successes you had. What did you do during that time? And then write down, what is the worst case thing that can happen to you if you try this? Write it down. And then what's the best 
What's the best case? Now, what steps do I have to take? Family in consideration. Am I financially? How long can I go with this? What is my plan? Is it solid? Have I talked to people who are like-minded? Do I have a network of mentors? Can they give me some feedback on this? Because you can't see those blind spots. We, can, we can't see our own blind spots. You need someone to bring you the reality of the spot. At the end of the day, there's two ways to go across. You can go across with a net that's an intrapreneur, someone working inside of a company who acts like an entrepreneur, but they're on somebody else's payroll, mine. Or you can be an entrepreneur and just go out there with the E, jump off, no net, and hope that you land. You got to look where you're going to jump before you ever jump, and you got to have a net at first to make sure you can make it across. Oh, my gosh. So, so some of the things you're saying is brilliant. Just- so, well, it's interesting. It is brilliant. And it's funny because um, I'm like, did you read my book? <laughs> because like in, in my chapter of Dream Big, Step Small, I talk about um, trusting the facts, not the feelings, T- talking about fear specifically. Mm. And I just love how we're so aligned in our mindset thinking there about, you know, I tell my audience all the time, trust the facts, not the feeling, talking about the worst case scenarios and best case scenarios. And hello, writing it down. Now you hail from Bill. You've heard it from me. Write down the worst that can yeah. happen. Talk to other people and gain different perspective because your perspective, like Bill just said, has blinders. You have blind spots all around you. You only see what you feel and what you've experienced, but there's plenty of other people that can speak into your life about the situation to help you move forward. You got to be brave enough to ask for that help, to ask for that input, put on your tough skin, roll up your sleeves and say, Hey, so-and-so friend, mentor, someone like me, someone like Bill, your mom, your whoever to say, Hey, Help me out here because I am, I'm blinded by my fear. I want to move forward. Help me out. You, you know, that was, I am going to read your book. We are very, very similar. And I want to say something that I don't want the audience or you to misconstrue this. The one thing that I do to get through life is humor. So when I say that's brilliant or this is great, a lot of that's self-deprecating humor to me because I just think it's funny. So a lot of the things that I do have humor to it, and that's a resilient bounce for me because I think that arrogance has no place in business. I think that arrogance is met with, with failure, and that failure is the dent to the ego, which is the representation of who we think we are. When we go deep inside, find out who we really are, what we really must have, we'll do those things, take those risks to go forward. If the pain isn't that great and we're comfortable living in this, it's okay, I'm, I'm good with being mediocre, then you're never going to take the pains it takes to make a change. Oh, you used my, the, my least Brilliant favorite again. word of all time. My <laughs> least favorite, yeah, my least favorite word of all time is literally mediocre. Someone asked me years ago when I jumped into this space, when I put myself out there, when I had no audience to talk to, and the first time I launched live, it was 33 people. And someone said, what's your biggest fear about launching? And I said, being mediocre. I said, I want to be the best me that I can be. And mediocre is my fear. And so that's the driving force to make me put my best foot forward on any given day is that I don't want to be mediocre. You know why? Because what do you remember that's mediocre? No one praises mediocre. They either say, this is the worst thing in the world and they give negative attention to something or they give positive to something that's best. But mediocre just gets ignored. And I just hate that word. So I had to bring that up because that's like, oh, talk about fear. That's my worst fear. (laughs) But again, there's something else in this enlightening repartee that we have. There's something else that's very important. You didn't talk about competing with others. You're talking about being the best version of you. And that is the most healthy way because it's a zero sum game to compare your success to the success of others. It's yours. You need to define success on your terms and you need to get and make yourself your toughest competitor not the external. Absolutely. Now, you're going to talk about this, these negative things, right? Comparison and all these negative words like you can't, you won't, you shouldn't, you're not good enough, you're going to fail like you did last time. Like, how can someone really learn? What is your strategy about learning to um, get rid of those negative thoughts and bring back, bring yourself back to a healthy mindset? The, the, my, the worst word to me in relationships of any kind is should. I don't think anyone, including me, we're not morally empowered to tell another person what they should do. That makes me shudder because as an independent thinker, which I fancy myself as, I don't want someone to tell me you should do this. I will just break right down. It takes a little more effort for me to coach and say, you might want to examine this. You might want to look at this. And what do you think would happen if you did this? A little more. But if I tell somebody should, I know the effect it has on me. So I want you to feel this. You know what, Kristen? You should do your show this way. Really, Bill? 
So I, I have that type of gene in me. It's called awareness. I also know that we work off of our own confirmation biases. So when I'm looking at someone for the first time, I'm in that instinct mode. Do I run? Do I fight? What do I do? Do I freeze? Do I like them at all? So I know what's happening. And I sometimes can fall, most times probably, sway to my own confirmation. So I want someone else to say, am I biases? This is what I'm seeing. What do you see? Or what do you see here? So I'm at least trying to get more information I can work off of rationally, because I understand that for the most part, we're emotional creatures. So I hope that's kind of a roundabout answer for what you asked me. You know, yeah, it's so interesting because I think we tell ourselves these things more than like, I can't remember the last time an actual person, aside from me and my own thoughts and head, came to me and said, you can't, you won't, you shouldn't, you need to. Like, honestly, other people don't talk to us like that, at least not to our face, people. They don't really say that to our face. Some people might. You have that mother-in-law that's like, you know, you really should, this and that. Honestly, though, we talk to ourselves like this. You can't, you won't, you're not enough. You'll never be good enough. You'll never have this, you'll never have that. And I, you know, in my book, another thing is like, flip the script. So I want your version of flip the script. When I tell people flip the script, it's taking that you can't, you won't, you shouldn't, or um, the ones that my clients always come back to me as is like, they're usually financial, right? They're like, I'm broke. I can't save. I can't make a dollar. I fail at everything. I invest money in a business and it always fails. I can't, I won't, I shouldn't, you know, and, and I tell them flip the script. Like I am capable of earning income. I am capable of saving money. Even if it's $1 at a time, I am capable of taking that dollar and putting it into a jar. I can. If I choose not to, that's a different story. If I choose to stay camped, right, setting up that camp at that negative, I can't, I won't, I shouldn't place, and instead choosing that. So what is your version of that flipping the script and talking to yourself in, in a way that changes your mindset? So I think there was a book my mother gave me, and it was The Four Agreements. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure she gave me that, and I looked at her, and, and I said to her, what, what do you give me a book that is, uh, I'm used to reading books that are pretty substantive you give me this little fluff book and it's it's pretty easy there's four things and it's so and number one was be impeccable with your word and, and i thought about that and i thought well okay that means you know whatever i say my word is my bond i live that my thought word deeds in alignment it's more than that it's self-talk it's the parasitic version of of self-talk that can eat you up alive because it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy how you act how you respond what you attract so, so, so many of us who play the role of victim or really think we are victims attract other victims. And we all want to stay wallowing in that same pot of mediocrity. And it's self-preservation or apathy, one or the other. So the default mode for our brain is to preserve us. So we want to be in that self-preservation mode. But some people just get to a point where it's apathy, where there is a misery loves company mentality that as long as no one is doing or Kristen is not doing better than Jillian, then everything is okay. But as soon as Kristen takes off, becomes her own person, takes that risk, gets out there and says, you know, from 33, I'm going to go to 333. And then I'm going to go beyond that with more zeros because I'm going to be the best version of me. That changes the whole dynamic of how you talk, how you see the world. You will limit it by self-talk as much as you can increase it by believing in the possibility of what if. I love what if. I love the positive what if though. See, I love, you know, when I hear clients say things like, well, you know, what if I lose all this money? What if my button, like when it comes to e-commerce, we're talking about creating new products, creating bundles that sell. And people always say, well, what if my bundle doesn't sell? I said, well, right. what if it does? Okay. But think about that. All of think this about that. Go ahead and ask the negative what if, but then address it. Right. In rational form, write it down in a journal. So what if this blows up to heck? What do I do? Because that exit strategy helps you go forward. Knowing that if your downside is I'm all in, if this fails, I don't know what I'm going to do. is probably not something you should do. If you don't have a plan B, you have no plan. Yeah. And I, I'd like to counter that with your plan B, just being the thoughts that you think this out. Like I joke about it all the time about working at Old Navy. Okay. I've never worked at Old Navy a day in my life. Um, but like, I joke about it cause it's like the nearest store to my house. Right. And I say, you know, well, if this doesn't work out, I guess I can go work at Old Navy. But the reality is that's my mental permission to keep going forward to saying, Hey, I always have a backup plan. I am smart enough and capable enough to even work a minimum wage job to feed my family if I must. And so in my head, that's my plan B, and it gives me permission to take all these risks. So let's talk to those folks, those people that I think like you and I, I'm not risk averse. I'm willing to push all in on different things because I, I don't know. I, someone tells me it's just this innate gift. I think it's skills learned over time to actually, you know, 
think through, through things and think worst case, best case and go, okay, what if I don't, I don't want regret so much mm -hmm. that I'm willing to take a crazy risk because I don't want to live here and sit here and go, what if I, what if I did do that? What if 2020 yeah. was the best year yet, despite pandemics and despite riots and despite all the things that are going on in the world right now, what if 2020 is still my best year? Or what if I sit here and go, well, I guess I'll just wait till 2021. Cause this year already seems like a flop. I mean, let's be real. So let's talk about to that person sitting here listening to us saying, but Kristen, but Bill, I'm not like you. I don't have the, the courage to take that next step. I'm naturally risk averse. I'm naturally one of those that kind of, kind constantly worries about making the next move or losing a dollar or, um, you know, being embarrassed or whatever that is. Let's talk to that person. You know, first thing I would say, welcome to the human race <laughs> because we're all, we're, we are all risk averse. We're risk averse and we we've learned to accept certain amounts of risk and we all, we all dislike change. It's part of our, of our nature that we're set up to survive that way. It's very important. And I address this in, in detail in my, in my book, fail more. It's very important to know the difference between fear, a real fear and, and danger. So a real fear that comes with danger is man, insect, animal that can kill you like that saber tooth tiger, right? We still bring that into our boardrooms today. It doesn't exist. But that's fear. It's the early warning system for danger. Or it's that thing that plays itself in, in the imagination of that bruise we had, we talked about, that cut, that setback, that regret. And we think, oh, no, if we do that again, we're going to be stuck. It's going to hurt. They're going to shame me. They're going to boo me off the stage. I'm not going to get any more than 33 listeners. It's going to be terrible. We've got to be able to overcome that and understand that it's our imagination taking us in its way. Number one, you're normal when you feel it. Number two, no one is a super person. We all have fears. We all have dealt with them in different ways, but we have fears, uncertainties. We're not going to get rid of it. We can lessen it by doing those things we fear with an intelligence behind it, a rational thought with the emotion. That's the first thing I'd say. It's number one. Rational thought. Number one, yeah, knowing we're all like, yeah, we all have fear. I have fear all the time. As a matter of fact, I just pitched a really big show to be on this podcast. And there was so much fear surrounding that pitch that I like literally didn't say it send for three days. But then I kept saying, you're going to regret it. What if they say yes? What if they say yes? And then I go, oh my gosh, what if they say yes? <laughs> and so, you know, kind of freaking out about like the, the fear of success, because I think, oh my gosh, you know, that that's more of a fear for me. It's like, well, it's not that hard to send a pitch that I think may never get read by the person that needs to read it to say yes to me but then what happens if they actually do what happens if i actually should have to show up to this big name show and and put on an interview that that i that's out of my league in my brain um and so i have fear of of success can you talk a little bit about that because i think it's a yeah. little bit more hidden than people than people I mean, are willing to admit well, i can tell you where it comes from like but i experience it every day i've experienced it for 27 years Success is it, the ego puts out a representation of what you want society to think you are. So I put out my cars, my titles, my companies, whatever it is. And it's the impression of Bill, what it should do, no matter whom it is, who it is, that's what it's going to be. Okay. So the more we become by societal expectations successful, the more we have to lose. At first we had nothing to lose. We had everything to gain. We didn't have a house. We didn't have the cars. We didn't have the, we didn't have the wherewithal to do these things. We had really nothing to lose. So we came from Western Pennsylvania. They put us in play and guess what? We just started to do pretty well. Then what happens is we don't want to lose. We don't want to get on the phone and get 300 rejections a day. That dents our ego. That dents our, we are successful. We don't want to hit that thing. So we stop and we try to coast through to success and it can't happen. So the first thing is you have to understand that success is um, by, ne by definition, very ephemeral. It's very short lived if you don't put the work behind it. You know, momentum is the easiest thing there is to lose. It's the hardest thing to gain. But that momentum of success comes with understanding that it's not about your ego. It's not about the dent to your self image. This is not it's personal, but it's not. It's personal in the way that you're going to invest personally and emotionally, but you're not going to take those hits as anything but a learning lesson. That's a mindset shift. That's the first thing. So when you talk about mindset, let's talk about the differences between like your fixed mindset and your growth mindset. And I think fixed mindset is something you, you, you have, you were taught, you learned along the way, and you, you've, you're stuck there. But talk about the, the fixed versus growth mindset. When that's it comes Carol to Dweck, failure yeah. specifically. Well, that, that's Carol Dweck, Stanford researcher, 20 some years ago, studied um, some kids and she took these kids into her class and she said, 
I'm going to give you insoluble problems and, you know, we'll go ahead and try to figure this stuff out. And the ones that are used to getting fixed grades that were used to getting the A's and, you know, if they did certain work because A plus B always equals C, they didn't do very well when it came to insoluble. Now, they did well on the other test when it was simply in a test where they said, wow, you must be smart. And they wrapped themselves around that ego part of I'm smart. They didn't want to get in that test that they couldn't solve and fail. But the other part, the other students said, wow, she said, you must really work hard. And they just kept working and digging and digging. And she found the takeaway from having a fixed mindset, which is a mindset that is constructed to get the A, the participation trophy, to get a certain, do the certain amount of work to get somewhere versus the ones that had the will part to just keep digging and trying to find. She found later that the bigger, bigger thing that pointed towards success in life was willpower over IQ. The biggest earners were the ones that had the most willpower. That is really the cliff notes of the growth and fixed mindset. Today, the way to be able to navigate the change of today is through a growth, growth mindset. Things aren't going to be perfect. Things, the approach isn't going to look perfect. You talked about the year being foreclosed. If you think it is, it is. You got to find a way or make a way through this because the ones that survive and adapt those most able to adapt are, adapt are going to have that growth-oriented mindset. They're going to find a way, make a way. They're not going to mail in the rest of the year. You know, that's so, that is so funny that you point that out because recently I was interviewed about, you know, the successes and one of the questions that the person asked, which this was like a totally unscripted, there was nothing that they sent ahead of time. He liked to do blind interviews. And of course, I, I'm all about that. It's fine. I'm willing to answer any question. But something that he asked me that it didn't catch me off guard. It just made me think was like, what, what do you feel was the key to your success all along going from, you know, your foreclosed home, literally, and thinking about you might have to live in your car to a seven figure business. How did you do that? What was that? Like, what is the one key? And that the answer is what you said is the, the ability to adapt to change instead of setting up and building a house on woe is me, poor me, this happened to me, whether something happened to you, that's your own fault or no fault of your own. We're going to yeah. have those kinds of tragedies or things that come into our lives, whether we bring it upon ourselves or whether it comes at us from, you know, like a pandemic, no fault of our own, but what is your ability, your ability to adapt to change is one of the keys to success and making change say, Oh, that didn't work out. What's the right. next step? What's the next pivot? What's the next place that's going to get me to this goal? And whether that goal is just your very next step, your very next dollar or something huge, dreaming big, then you still have to take that first small step and adapt to yes. that change. Especially our e-commerce listeners right now, our Amazon people, y'all know all Amazon ever does is change, right? All they ever do is change a rule. How many emails do I get? How many messages do I get all the time? Like, oh, Amazon changed this and this. Now we can't do this and this. You can cry about it. You can whine about it. You can set up your camp there and grieve. and Or you can say, okay, this is the new change. What do I need to do to adapt to it? How can I yeah. change my business to follow this path? Because this is the only choice I've got. It's either sit in camp and cry or it's change. Take the energy of worry, channel it into working on your skills. That's the product. So no matter what you're putting on Amazon, just keep working on the product. You are the ultimate product. Keep working on what you import, read, study, think, take time to practice introspection, find yourself, and then become a better product because you're making those moves that you're going to be so good people, you can't fail but notice you. I mean, that's always been my mindset. And I'll tell you the other thing you mentioned, dreams. The thing about dreams, the difference between dreams and fantasies is a dream is something that comes with goals, goals that, are at, that can be realized. That means realistic goals. If I wanted to be an astronaut, I couldn't be. You know why? Because I really suck in math. There's no way. Beyond other reasons, if I wanted to play in the NBA, I'm 6'2 and I can't shoot. So I ain't going to make it. Now, I can pump up a ball, roll it out there, but that's not making it. You need to have dreams that are realistic. You need to be in an environment that supports those dreams, an environment that's right for you to flourish in, because I couldn't do what I do in other environments. So many people fail because they're in the wrong environment. So many people fail because they don't do the work in that environment. So I think you need to have the confluence of the goals realistic, setting up and doing the work to reach those goals in the right environment. Those three things are huge. Other than that, you're going to set yourself up to fail. Now, 
you know, you talk about these goals and have setting effective goals. So, you know, as you mentioned, failing your way forward, you know, what, what's helpful when it's, what is it, how do you expect to fail during setting your goals? Like no one, I mean, if you think about this for a minute, no one sits and thinks, mm -hmm. I'm going to fail. I plan to fail. This is what I'm going to do. They set these goals and they're like, okay, mm -hmm. I want to keep taking the steps towards that uh, and, and get to that goal and reach okay. that goal, whether it's realistic or, you know, beyond their scope or whatever else. But, you know, if you look at the journey of anyone that's been successful, it doesn't look like this. It's not this straight yes. line. It's this up and down. Oh no, I failed. Okay. Start at square one. Sometimes it squiggles back around to this, then goes back here. So when you talk about goal setting for a minute, like how, how can we plan to fail in the middle of our, our journey towards our goals yeah. and our dreams? Uh, it's the hero's journey to me. It's the only way you can ever learn. So for me personally, I was sent by Liberty Mutual, large company, to learn how to sell their product. And I was horrible. I mean, they sent me all over the United States. And so I would fumble and stumble and I just couldn't work up a script. I couldn't do the open probe closes. I really didn't know what selling was. I couldn't do it very well. And I asked myself a question, how much are you willing to endure to become successful? How many times do you have to hear no? And I said, if I have to hear it a thousand times to get one, I'm willing to make that sacrifice. That's number one, ask yourself the question, how bad do I need this? Not want it, how bad do I need it? So my goal was this, pasted up a picture of a Ferrari, pasted up a picture of California, a home overlooking the ocean, never been to California, didn't even know what a Ferrari looked like except on a video game. And so every call I made, every time I failed, I kept learning. What did I say wrong? What did I do? Had people listen to me? Had people coach me? Okay, I got it. This is what I'm going to do. I failed my first 13 times in the job. 13 times. So what I did is get out of that car at a brown station wagon, oxidized, no hubcaps in the south of Richmond selling $300 policies to floral shops. And I left the script in the car. I untied my tie, left the jacket, and I asked this one important question that I asked every time of anyone in sales. I learned it just by doing it that day on that curbside. Where are you from? How'd you start this business? And I shut up. Because all the fear they had of somebody coming up trying to take their money and not learning who they were or what they wanted dissipated in every word they said. That's what I learned. And from there, I became the top salesperson in that company by tying that goal, that dream to those pictures to make it my vision every day to say, what do you really want from life? It's freedom. It's freedom. And freedom comes by moving through fear. Fre freedom comes by making the tough choices. Freedom comes by sacrifice and hard work. And to me, there is nothing like freedom. That was it. Amen to that. I can tell you right now that that is definitely something that we have in common when it comes to that. I never dreamed super big um, because I was afraid of that. I was like, I never was taught that. I was never taught that I, you know, put the Ferrari out there or this. I mean, honestly, I, I'm still dreaming of my beach house and I'm going to get that beach house. It's going to be half in Michigan and half in somewhere else. Um, I haven't decided a location yet, but the, the whole, when I, the first dream I had was big just house. to go on a tropical vacation, right? I mean, this was when I was younger and, you know, we didn't come from money. We didn't have anything. And I thought right. I'm going to earn the next $50 because I want to go on this vacation. And eventually I'm going to go on this vacation. And then I'm going to go on a 10 day all inclusive. And that, you know, had this idea, but first it was just this mm -hmm. four day vacation that I wanted to go on and took the small steps to say every single time, I'm going to do this. I'm going to earn the next $10, put it in a jar. I'm going to earn the next $10, put it in the jar and kept pushing towards that goal. No matter how many times my item didn't sell on e-commerce, whether it was, I brought this item to the table and that didn't work or this system didn't work or that system didn't work and just kept pushing forward because it wasn't about what system was going to work. It was about the freedom attached to, I can have that if I want it, but you cannot gloss that over you guys. Forget about what society is telling you. Forget about what you see on Instagram. Forget about what you're seeing on Facebook and hearing about on Twitter and all this stuff. The road to success and freedom gets dirty hands and muddy feet. This is not skipping along with in your Ferrari, eventually in your Ferrari, but ask that person that got that, how long it took to get there. Because all you're seeing on, on, on social media is the result. What they yeah. don't show you is when they were in the trenches with dirty faces, dirty hands, and scraped up elbows doing the work that it takes to get there. Yeah, not only that. The disingenuous part of it all is for the most part, you're seeing the bullshit of people sitting in somebody else's car, somebody else's yacht, somebody else's plane. So, I mean, it's just all a game. 
but but and you're 100 right about breaking nails getting your hands dirty and i want to say this that that for anyone me you don't give away your dreams and let somebody else live those dreams because you're afraid to do the work and to chase those dreams and do what it takes to get there because somebody else is going to do it. You know, why not you? Why seed your responsibility for greatness? Why give it away already through negative self-talk, which we talked about by not being willing to do the work by accepting how mediocre feels. You know, if you don't feel that mediocrity, that, uh, the bonds of mediocrity, then you're never going to be able to break through to freedom. You're never going to be doing, you're never going to do the work. You're never going to burn your boat and go forward. You're always going to have a foot in the dock and a foot on the boat, and you're never going to get on the boat of opportunity because you're too afraid to leave. You know, I want to finish up with, with your final thoughts about that, because I think, you know, talking about, you know, the burning your boat and keeping your foot on the dock and one in the boat and everything else is, is that, that feeling, the false sense of security that somehow this fear is giving people. So you think you have this security. I'm just going to stay safe in this, on this dock. I'm just going to stay safe here because I've already risked my time. I've already risked my money. I've always already risked my pride. I've already risked all these things in order to try to make this work. And so the person that's on the verge of quitting or throwing in the towel because they've already done all these things and they've already failed. Um, let's talk about that false sense of that security net that that fear is telling yeah. them that this is the safe place. Again, ask yourself that question, the ultimate question. Is there any such thing as ultimate security in life? The answer is no. You, the answer is no. You can walk out of this building and get hit by a car. There is no security. There is no protection from those things that can happen. But we live as if well, we're going to live forever by making these choices in this secure bubble because we, we are very secure. We're secure in the ignorance that we think we know. We're, we're not willing to put ourselves out there and risk intelligently. And I'm not trying to talk a family of eight or seven or six for the, the breadwinner to go out and try to sell insurance or to try to do what you do. I'm not saying that. You've got to work your way into that skill set. You've got to work your way by learning and taking those small steps, intelligent risks forward, knowing what your worst case is, and then going in again with that intelligent, rational approach. But I will say this, there is no security. There isn't, it's all an illusion. If we don't see that from the events that are happening today, then we're not, we're not watching anything or we're not walking out away from our building to have to put on a mask. There ain't no security. So live your life, live your best life now. Go back to what your father told you about living that best life now. Now is the day. Now, that doesn't mean be irresponsible. You're not irresponsible with your fear or your approach to fear. That means responsible. Enjoy your life now because you don't know about tomorrow. Well, and I, and I love that because the reality is that we don't have that. We don't have that security. We, we don't, you know, living in a pandemic right now, we're now we're all forced to walk out and wash our hands more than ever and wear masks and not eat at restaurants and not go to, you know, live music and everything else. You know, we, we thought we had this secure country, right? Oh, we're, you know, we're the big bad USA. Nothing's going to happen to us, right? I'm going to wear um, this helmet when I walk out of here. Yeah, I, you might get over. hit by that Ferrari after all. <laughs> you know, wear it when I'm in the Ferrari. What are you talking about? <laughs> just in case so all right bill i i so much appreciate your time and your and your expertise in this area and if there's just one takeaway that you can leave with every leave everybody with right now what is that one takeaway the one takeaway is again is more a philosophical approach and i would like and encourage the reader to pick up their own pen metaphorically and pick up a pen and know that every day you are writing the story of your life you have the pen you have the choice to change that script change that narrative. You're going to have to do the work. You're going to have to take risks. You're going to have to learn to fail, but you're going to fail forward. Make it a letter, a passage, or a book that others can learn and grow from. That'd be my takeaway. Awesome. Well, where, where's every, where can everybody connect with you after this show? I know they're going to want to come to you and learn more from you. Where can they connect? Uh, Bill Woodich, that's W-O-O-D-I-T-C-H dot com. Bill Woodich dot com is my website, at Bill Woodich. You can follow me on all those social media things. The things you, th you see on those platforms are real, <laughs> but it's at Bill Woodich, W-O-O-D-I-T-C-H. Awesome. And you guys, you can get both of these books on Amazon and the, the links are going to be in the show notes. You want to make sure that you get both of those books because they're really going to help you. Of course, get my book alongside of it because I think there's a lot of things that are in alignment. So whether it's my perspective, Bill's perspective, somebody else, get rid of that fear. No regrets. All right. Next time. We'll see you next time. Same place on the Amazon files.